you bow for uh, uh, preparing and sharing this testimony, even though you are an introvert. You did an awesome job. <laughs> Let's all uh, read the word of God together from uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through uh, 37. And the message title is The uh, Danger of uh, Repeatedly Denying the Obvious. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 37. Ready? I begin. Then they brought him a, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that, that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the princes, a prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by a fearsful, by whom do your people drive them out? So then that they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So, and so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings uh, good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And the God's people said, Amen. Again, the message title is uh, The Danger of Repeatedly Denying the Obvious. Let me ask you a question. When uh, someone denies the obvious, how does that make you feel? It's just obvious, and this person refused to uh, ex you know, acknowledge the obvious. You feel frustrated, right? And when someone repeatedly denies the obvious, how does that make you feel? You feel drained. And when someone repeatedly denies the obvious to a point, where you sense that he's not going to change his mind, how does that make you feel? You feel hopeless, and you will most likely end your relationship with him or her, especially if the matter that he or she denies is a serious one in nature. You just cannot converse with this person. You drop it, and if the nature is very serious, on which you uh, disagree, and this person is denying the very obvious, you just go separate ways. You can't do life together with that type of person. Why do people deny the obvious? There could be several different reasons as to why people deny what is very obvious. Number one, due to ignorance. They don't know any better. So they just deny the obvious, and there's not much wrong with that. They just, they just have to learn and be exposed to the truth. Second reason could be due to envy, jealousy, fear, and uh, that leads to hatred. When people are very uh, envious, jealous, or afraid, or they hate somebody, they will deny the obvious. And due to pride. They know it is wrong, they know it is right, but they just refuse to acknowledge because they are full of pride. And finally, due to stubbornness of their hearts and eventually hardening of their hearts, people refuse to acknowledge what is very obvious. In today's passage, we see a group of Pharisees who denied what was very obvious, and as a result, they are rebuked and chastised by Jesus Christ. My prayer is that, that we will not be like those Pharisees whose hearts were hardened and who couldn't accept the obvious truth but we will always have tender and humble hearts that know how to acknowledge and receive the obvious truth. Why did Pharisees repeat, uh, repeatedly deny the obvious? From the scripture reading, you know that they were proud. They were envious and jealous of Jesus Christ because Jesus was ascending. And they were, he was gaining a popularity and a fame amongst people. And they didn't like that. And they were fearful of Jesus Christ. And they hated Jesus. And eventually their hearts were hardened. And therefore they denied the obvious truth as a defense mechanism. Verse 33 through 35, Jesus says this, Make a tree good, and that its fruit will be good. 
or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers. Jesus is making an indictment against these Pharisees who refuse to you know, acknowledge the obvious. You know, one day Jesus was ministering to people in this particular village. We don't know where this took place, but he was ministering to people, and the people, out of their care and concern, brought this man to Jesus Christ who was blind and mute, who also happened to be demon-possessed. Not every sickness and disease is caused by evil spirits, but some are. And in this case, in this man's case, it seems as though the reason why he became mute and blind was because of the forces of the evil spirits. And the evil spirits, they do uh, stuff like this at times. And we don't know how long this man had been suffering under the power of the evil spirits. But just imagine you being blind and mute. You put yourself in this person's situation. You've been blind and mute uh, for who knows how long. Five years, ten years, all your life, we don't know. That's a very sad and miserable way to live. You can't see and you can't speak. Moreover, it is also a very painful thing for his parents to watch him go through and live this kind of life. However, when this person was brought to Jesus Christ, he was instantaneously healed by Christ. What a glorious day this must have been. Verse 22, they, then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. You can talk for the first time in your life. You can see for the first time. You can see the blue sky. You can see the trees. You can see the grass. You can see this loved one's faces possibly for the first time. It was a glorious day. And how would you have responded to this situation if you were his parent, brother, sister, wife, or friend? Wouldn't you have been thrilled and excited? You would have. However, a group of people who were actually looking at this thing happening, you know, you know, makes a very sort of unfortunate response. And in verse 23, it says this, All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of God, the David? The term the son of David is equivalent to the Messiah because Jewish people knew that if the Messiah comes, he will come from the line of King David. So at least they knew that. So they were asking each other, could this Jesus be the Messiah that we've been waiting for? They knew that Jesus you know, came down from the lineage of you know, King David. However, can he actually be the Messiah that we've been waiting for? The answer should be, yes, this Jesus who came from the line of David is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. If they strictly you know, went by the miracles that Jesus Christ you know, has been uh, performing amongst them. The lepers were cured, blind, see, mute, speak, and then the lame side to walk. And if they strictly went by the miracles that he's been performing, they should have said, this is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. You know why? Because according to the Old Testament prophecy, only the Messiah could actually open the eyes of the blind. It's prophesied in the book of Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 35. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees, and I give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. See, the prophecy that the God will come, when God comes, you know, what's he going to do? He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind will be opened and the, t and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. These type of things were happening right in their midst, you know, by, you know, the miracles that Jesus Christ performed. However, these people could not readily admit that Jesus was the Messiah because he didn't fit the mold of the image of the Messiah that they had in mind. They knew that this type of things had to happen if the Messiah comes, but on top of that, they had different expectations and understanding and idea about what Messiah ought to be like. This kind of Messiah, uh, the, the kind of Messiah that they wanted and anticipated was a strong, conquering king, but this Jesus was too simple, too plain, too humble, and too meek. That's why they couldn't readily admit that this Jesus Christ, who's performing these amazing things, was the Messiah they've they been waiting for. So they didn't know what to make of this Jesus. So they were astonished, which is a sign of not joy and excitement, but bewilderment and even disbelief. When the Bible says they were astonished, it's not in the, uh, the, the way of, wow, this is great, you know, and excitement. It's a bewilderment and a disbelief. And they asked this question, could this be the son of David? Could this be the Messiah? 
This is not a rhetorical question that generates an obvious answer. Rather, this was a question, uh, a negative question that drew, drew out the negative answer, response. So the desired and expected answer was no, he could not, he cannot be the Messiah. Nonetheless, everything was just going fine for the family members and the friends of the men who received the healing from Jesus Christ. It was a glorious day, at least for these people, because their brother, their son, their husband, was able to see everything was going fine until Pharisees showed up. So a glorious day got ruined by these uh, uh, Pharisees. Verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, and Beelzebul is the prince of demons, basically Satan, the devil, the prince of demons that this fellow drives out demons. This is a ridiculous response, right? It's a ridiculous response. It doesn't make any sense. There is no logic in this thing. The Pharisees said this, these kinds of foolish things simply because they hated Jesus Christ and they wanted to get rid of Christ you know, by whatever the means that they could use. Why is their response ridiculous and foolish? First of all, demons are Satan's cohorts or underlings. They work for this, uh, the, the devil by entering into people's lives and creating havoc in, in them. This means driving out, driving out the demons to heal and restore a person is working and fighting against Satan. Therefore, healing and exorcism, you know, cannot be the work of Satan. Satan does not and cannot drive out himself, you know, from a person. He doesn't kick himself out from this person. Verse 25, 26, Jesus uses various different examples to illustrate and explain this point. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. If there's a civil war going on, what's going to happen? The nation will be destroyed. You, you, you hurt, you kill each other. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If husband and wife go at each other, cussing at one another, getting mad and angry at one another, what's going to happen to the family? It will be destroyed. It will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? So Jesus is saying in these verses that Satan does not self-destruct. If he did, we would have seen it right before our eyes. But as far as Satan's kingdom is concerned, it is still strong, it is still intact, it is still going on. So Satan does not self-destruct. That's why it is ridiculous to think and say to people that Jesus is driving out, driving out demons from people by Satan's power. Satan simply does not do this. Second of all, there were people, especially among the Pharisees, who practiced exorcism during Jesus' time. Interestingly, the Sadducees, another group of people called Sadducees, did not practice exorcism because they didn't believe in the spiritual realm and spiritual world. They didn't believe that spirits existed. They, were there, but they didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ either. But it was the Pharisees who actually believed in the spiritual realm and the spir uh, spirits. So Jesus asked the Pharisees a brilliant question that put them on the hot seat. What did, what did he say? If I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people, your people, your friends, your colleagues drive, out, uh, drive them out? So then they will be your judges. What is Jesus doing here by asking this question? If these Pharisees say to people that Jesus is driving out demons by the power of Satan, then they have to say the same thing in regards to their fellow Pharisees who actually had the exorcism ministry. But they couldn't do that because they knew that their fellow Pharisees were driving out demons not by the power of uh, Satan, but by the power of God. And if they were to say that their fellow Pharisees drove the demons out by the power of Satan, then those Pharisees who practiced exorcist ministry would have gotten really upset with these guys and the relationship would have been broken. And there would have been, uh, you know, fight breaking out amongst a group of Pharisees. Doesn't make any sense. So Jesus brilliantly silenced the Pharisees who made some ridiculously foolish comment due to the hardness of their heart. They stubbornly refused to acknowledge the obvious truth. Having said that, Jesus is saying that if I am not casting out the evil spirits by the power of Satan, then what's happening in your midst? He gives us the answer. Verse 28, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. From this verse, we get actually extra at least four different observations. One is, there is a major battle going on between Jesus and Satan. Between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. We have to open our eyes and see. Like, you know, person like Baal 
after he lost his grandmother, who just gave an unconditional love, right? Just lost all motivation. Who's doing that? Taking away the you know, reason to live so that they don't self-destruct and they will get depressed and dejected and deflated. Who's doing that? Do you think it's just a mental thing? There's an evil world out there. You've got to open your eyes and see the spiritual battle that is taking place between God and Satan. The kingdom of heaven and kingdom of Satan. Kingdom of light and kingdom of darkness. You should be able to see with your eyes open that these type of things happen. Jesus is saying the kingdom of God has come upon you. There's a battle going on. Number two, Jesus is stronger than Satan. Healing and casting out evil spirits are signs of this thing. That Jesus, that proves that Jesus is stronger than Satan. Jesus is using everyday example here to make a point about his relationship to Satan and what he's doing to him. The strong man in this illustration is Satan. And Jesus is the one who ties him up to carry out, you know, his, uh, carry off his possessions. And his possessions are the demons that go into people's lives to hurt and destroy them. When Jesus healed people and cast out evil spirits from them, he first had to tie up a Satan. Without this being done first, Jesus would not have been able to ch chase out demons from people. These people cannot be freed you know, from demons unless their top leader, Satan, is all tied up and bound first. Therefore, people being set free from the evil spirits is a clear example that Jesus has the upper hand over Satan, and Satan is losing his battle. Even though it is going on, slowly but surely, Jesus is invading the territory of Satan. He's winning the battle, little by little. Verse 29, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house, that strong man is Satan, and carry off his possessions, his underlings, unless he first ties up the strong man. Jesus is the one who's tying up and binding and Satan. Then he can plunder his house. Jesus can go in and I set these people free and I heal these people. Third thing is Jesus is the Messiah. He's a strong, conquering Messiah. The Israelites wanted their Messiah to be politically and militarily powerful and strong because that was all they cared about because of the felt need. They were under the oppression of the Roman Empire and they really wanted to be set free from this bondage. But what they didn't see was more than this military freedom, political freedom. What they really needed was a spiritual freedom. Their spiritual eyes weren't open to see what was truly important and was at stake. If they truly knew God's word and understood the mess messianic prophecies correctly, if their spiritual eyes were open and saw how powerful and mighty Jesus was, defeating their true enemy, Satan, and conquering his domain little by little, they would have recognized Jesus Christ as the Messiah. That's because in the end, that's all it matters. Everything will get burnt up except our soul. And Jesus is setting us free so we can experience the freedom from the bondage of sin that chains us. Unfortunately, they didn't have the eyes to see all this because they were just too focused on what was visible, what was physical, what was material, and what was temporal. This healing of the blind and the mute and setting him free from demon possession should have been enough for people to recognize that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Do you and I see Jesus Christ working in our life? Do we see Jesus Christ as the powerful, conquering king who is invading the darkness of our life and a shedding light you know, upon our lives? And the fourth thing is, the kingdom of God has begun. It is already here, but not yet fully. Satan is still working very powerfully in our midst in this world. You just have to look around and see how powerful he is. His kingdom is still going on. But Jesus has begun to destroy his kingdom little by little. This means the kingdom of God is here with us already, even though it is not yet fully with us. Therefore, there is a phrase, already, but not yet. Now, in light of this, in light of Jesus Christ winning the battle and is conquering the domain of darkness, and uh, he, is, he has the upper hand. In light of this, whose side will you be on? Whose side will you be on? There are two kingdoms battling against each other. And you must choose one to join. Which one would you choose to join? The answer is obvious. You must be on Jesus' side. To not choose Jesus Christ is to deny the obvious. Hence the sermon title. To not choose Jesus is to deny the obvious. Verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me. 
and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Life Application Bible says this, Two mighty powers therefore are standing face to face, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the king and the center of the kingdom of heaven. But this means that every person on earth has to make a choice for or against Jesus. Anyone who thinks he can stand his ground alone or at least part from Jesus stands in principle on the side of the great adversary. There is no neutral ground, guys. There is no middle ground. There is no neutral ground between Jesus and Satan. If we are not with Jesus Christ, then we are with Satan. If we are not gathering with Jesus Christ, then we are scattering against Jesus. If we are not working for Jesus, then we are working against Jesus. There is no middle ground. What is your choice? Who do you choose? Whose side are you on? The time to make your choice is right now because you've heard the message today. The more you hear, the more you are responsible for your life. That's why it's not really good to hear lots of messages. You have to choose. Why? Because now you've heard today's message coming up from the mouth of your pastor. To delay in choosing Jesus Christ is to deny the obvious, and that is a dangerous thing to do. You know why? It's because there's one sin that will not be forgiven. One sin that will not be forgiven. Jesus forgives every kind of sin that we commit if we honestly confess and humbly repent of our sins. He even forgives us when we speak blasphemous words against Jesus Christ. That is how gracious Jesus is. But there is one sin that he does not forgive, and it is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Verses 31 and 32. And I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. That sin will not be forgiven forever. And forever is forever. Jesus is not saying that he is lower than the Holy Spirit. He is not saying that, hey, Holy Spirit is above me and I'm here. So if you sin against me, then I will forgive you. But if you sin against him, then it cannot be. He's not saying that. The triune God is three persons, three co-equal persons in one. What he's saying is that our sin against him, our blasphemous words against Jesus Christ that we speak, you know, all can be forgiven if we sincerely confess and repent because we commit this type of sins due to ignorance, due to our doubt, or due to our fear. Peter is a classic example. He denied Jesus Christ due to fear, but what did Jesus do? He forgave his sin, and he used him as a pillar of the early church. Paul persecuted Jesus Christ due to ignorance, but Jesus forgave him and used him in a mighty way as an apostle to the Gentile. Thomas doubted the risen Christ, but when, he, when Jesus appeared to him, he broke down and he repented before Christ. He then went, went, he, he then went all the way to uh, India to tell people about the risen Christ. His sin of unbelief was completely forgiven. There is no sin that Jesus Christ does not forgive if we come to him with a contrite a spirit and confess our sins and uh, sincerely ask him for forgiveness. There is no sin that Jesus does not forgive. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit Speaking against the Holy Spirit is different from all this because it is denying the obvious work of the Holy Spirit. If denying Jesus Christ stems from ignorance, fear, or doubt, denying the obvious work of the Holy Spirit stems from a willfully hardened heart. It doesn't come from a doubt or fear or ignorance. It comes from a willfully hardened heart. And as long as we have a hardened heart, we cannot or won't you know, we will not ask for forgiveness. If our hearts are hardened against Jesus Christ, we will not ask for forgiveness. And if we do not ask for forgiveness, then there is no forgiveness. And if there is no forgiveness, then there is no salvation. Look at these Pharisees that Jesus is talking to. It is clearly obvious that the, what Jesus was doing was the work of the Holy Spirit. A mute speaks, blind sees, evil spirits that have been tormenting this man for many years. They are cast out, so he's experiencing freedom. It is obvious that it is the work of the Holy Spirit. But due to the hardness of their hearts, they attributed the work of the Holy Spirit done through Jesus Christ to Satan. Here, the Pharisees were not blaspheming and denying Jesus Christ, but the work of Jesus Christ that was done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as long as they maintain this kind of stubborn and hardened heart, 
they cannot be saved because they will never come to Jesus Christ to ask for forgiveness. Where there is no forgiveness, there is no salvation. And Jesus is not refusing to forgive them. He wants to forgive these people. But they are refusing to ask Christ for forgiveness. This is a serious business right here. But oftentimes we can bring it down to maybe personal level. We don't have to go so far as to uh, deny the work of the Holy Spirit. But the, when we are arguing and debating and fighting against one another, something is very obvious. But if you are so stubborn and you made up your mind and that you will not change whatsoever, then there is no relationship right there. Because we refuse to acknowledge what is very obvious. You're the problem. You're the elephant in the room. But you refuse to change. I am the problem. I am the elephant in the room. But I refuse to acknowledge that I am the problem and I refuse to change it. Then there is no relationship. There is no fellowship. If you bring it to the higher level, deny the obvious work of the Holy Spirit because of the hardened heart, that you're not going to come to Jesus Christ asking for forgiveness. If there's no forgiveness, then there is no salvation. That's why if you blaspheme against the work of the Holy Spirit, then there is no hope for you. What do you think happened to these Pharisees? I didn't think about their uh, eternal destiny, but you know, one uh, comment here that I like uh, to read. This is what he said. He's a Dutch guy. He's supposed to be very uh, mild and meek, but he went so far as to say this. Amazing. One might ask whether Jesus' words in verses 31 and 32 meant that the Pharisees who slandered him in verse 24 were beyond forgiveness. One might wonder whether these people's sin is beyond forgiveness. It seems hard to avoid the conclusion that they were. It was beyond forgiveness. He's saying that. It seems hard to avoid the conclusion that they were. It was a beyond forgiveness. Their sin indeed was a sin against the Holy Spirit. Whatever their personal opinion of Jesus may have been, it was only through the willful perversity that they could have ascribed his exorcism of the demons to Beelzebub. Who are the modern-day Pharisees? We don't have Pharisees in this world anymore. But who are the modern-day Pharisees? We have some people like that. I think a very well-known militant atheist, a modern-day Pharisee. Some of these well-known atheists, atheists, you know that, you know, Chris, you know, uh, what is it, uh, Christopher Hitchens and uh, Richard Dawkins and these you know, camp who go around and debating you know, you know, with uh, you know, Christians. Some of these well-known atheists debate with Christian apologists a lot. And in order to prepare themselves really well for the debates, they most likely read a lot about the Bible and the Christian literature to equip themselves for these debates. Furthermore, they most likely observed the Christians and researched and investigated the effects of Christians uh, have had in this world. In other words, they have way too much information about Christ, about Christians, about Christian faith, and about Christian influence all over the world or throughout history. But with all this information, they still reject, deny, ridicule, and attack Christians and Christian faith. These atheists, just like the Pharisees during Jesus' time, deny the very obvious repeatedly. Repeating one time is a different thing. There is a hope and a possibility that, that you can return. But the more you deny, it's almost like a stepping on the ground and make it harden you know, like, you know, like a ground. And a seed cannot penetrate through that soil because you are repeatedly denying the obvious. This is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and it cannot be forgiven. And there, is, and there are everyday, ordinary atheists and agnostics you know, amongst us. Many of us in this room are not well read. We're not. Because we are busy doing this. We don't open up the you know, you know, books and we go deep into academics. Not many of us are well read or deeply into academics. However, some everyday ordinary people are still very atheistic or agnostic, denying what is very obvious. What obvious facts and truths do these people willfully deny or ignore? All throughout history, it's been almost always Christians who went to the remotest parts of the world to build schools, orphanages, and hospitals to care for the poor and the needy. Have you seen a lot of non-Christians doing that? Not that many. Almost always it's the Christian missionaries who go to very difficult parts of the world to create and start orphanage, schools, and hospitals to take care of these people. It's a historical fact that the world Christians go, society develops and brightens. Here I am talking about those 
Here, I'm not talking about those phonies uh, who use the name of Jesus Christ to make a personal profit, like those crusaders. Crusaders weren't Christians. You have to know your history well. Crusaders weren't Christians. So when people pick on you know, like a Christian faith using crusaders, you have to say that those are phonies. They weren't Christians. We're talking about legitimate, authentic, genuine Christians who went to different parts of the world to do all these amazing things. Wherever these uh, authentic Christians go, places get better and places brighten up. These are just the clear evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit, but some people just deny the obvious. Why do people deny the obvious? It's because it is the matters of the heart. It's the matters of the heart. Jesus said the reason why the Pharisees said those ridiculous words that blasphemed the uh, Holy Spirit was because their heart condition was not good. If the root or tree is bad, the fruit will always be bad. But if the root or tree is good, then the fruit will always be good. It is the matters of the heart. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Jesus is not talking about some silly words or jokes that we craft. He's not talking about that. Although we have to be careful at times about the silly words that we speak. However, the words that Jesus is saying that by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. He's talking about these words that come out of these people's mouth who are trying to deny the obvious work of the Holy Spirit. Those type of words will be used against these people. And again, let me just bring it down to a more personal level. We don't go so far as to deny the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we are so stubborn about our own ways, we refuse to change. That is not good. That is the spirit of Pharisees. Don't do that, guys. When the obvious truth is revealed to you and presented to you right before your eyes, and multiple people are saying the same thing, that you have to have the listening heart and the listening ears to be able to say that, yes, I must change. But if you take it too far, then that you can actually you know, go against the Holy Spirit, which is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you a question. What's in your heart? Not what's in your wallet. What's in your heart? What is in your heart? Do you have a heart that is at least honest, good, and sincere enough to see and acknowledge the obvious? Do you? Hmm? What do you see here at New Life? What do you see in your house church? And what do you see in our Thailand team? And what do you see in Tony and Judy Wen, who left everything here in Houston and brought their two little children to go to Africa to work at a hospital to train up African doctors? What do you see in this church? Don't you see the reality of Jesus Christ in all this? Don't you see the power of God here? And don't you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit here in this place called New Life Fellowship? You do. You do. Then what's stopping you from receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? What's deterring you from being with Jesus and standing, you know, and siding with Him? And what is hindering you from gathering with Jesus Christ? Why do you refuse to choose Jesus. Why do you refuse to come all the way to the side of Jesus Christ? You put one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God and always struggle. All these strange yet beautiful things that the, you are witnessing here at New Life Fellowship cannot be done if the root is bad and evil. If the root is good, then the fruit will be good. If the heart is good, then the life will be good. It is the matters of the heart. What's in your heart, guys? Hmm? Do you have a perfect heart? You don't. Do you have a perfect love in your heart? You don't. So I don't expect you to have a perfect heart or perfect love. I don't expect that from you as your pastor. But do you at least have a sincere and honest heart to see and acknowledge that what you see here is different and it must be the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of God? Are you at least honest to acknowledge that? Hmm? If so, then it is time for you to come to Jesus. It is time to, for you to set aside, to leave the stubbornness of your heart, whatever that may be, 
If you are Christ followers, you're not going to deny the work of the Holy Spirit. You don't go that far. There are some things that you're just holding on to. You refuse to change because of the stubbornness of your heart. It's time for you to humble yourself and surrender your life over to Jesus Christ. You know that this is what you're supposed to do. This is the obvious thing that you're supposed to do. Don't fight Jesus. Do the obvious. Do not commit that one sin that will never be forgiven by God, which is hardening of your own heart by refusing to admit what is obvious. Jesus is in this place. The Holy Spirit is working in and through the members of your life. You see it here. You see it in your house church. You see the Holy Spirit working everywhere. Don't deny this. It's a dangerous thing to deny this guy. Come to Jesus. Surrender your life fully and completely to him. That is the obvious thing that you and I must do. He will meet you where you are. He will take away all your worries and the fears. And he will lead you to that place where you can begin to experience the life that you've always wanted to live. Life that is abundant, full of joy, meaning, and satisfaction. Let's pray together.